I just called the office in Nashville to make sure that Rubel uh, is bringing a bunch with him because I only have about a dozen left. I'd be glad to give them out afterwards. But we're attempting to address some issues about church renewal and so on, and uh, we hope that it'll be useful. We'd like for you to see a copy. I think he'll have a bunch with him. We had originally intended to call it New Wine, but uh, Jerry Rushford at Pepperdine pointed out to us that's two words a lot of our people don't like, new and wine, and so we opted for wine skins, and uh, we'd like you to see a copy of that. Love, And I said, well, let me talk about five different angles of love. What I want to do, since I'm speaking mostly to people who then can speak to other people, is... Uh, share with you some ideas of how I think we need to present to Christians the concept of biblical love. In other words, I'm not going to preach at you, but try to share with you some things that I had to work through, working with lots and lots of college students, many of them uh, knowing they were in love, others wondering if they were in love, others not sure there was such a thing as love, trying to figure out what does it mean to have biblical love. And out of that grew this, this concept of five different kinds, five edges of biblical love. And as we go through them, I'll put them up here, something like uh, this last minute pie that I put together here. We'll try to anchor them in the nature of God. That's what I really wanted to do with this idea is not let the world define for us what love is because then sometimes it's too little and sometimes too much it's too gushy or it's too mean but we don't want as Christians the world to tell us what love is so we're going to look at five different edges of love five different sides of this biblical picture of love in marriage the first one is what the Bible calls covenant love or covenant loyalty. Just pull one out of the rack. You might look at Psalm 136. It's an interesting psalm because there is a refrain that keeps coming through. Each verse ends with the words, For God's kessed endures forever. And that can be translated in a lot of ways, but it would be the Hebrew word, uh, spell it a couple different ways, but it means something like loyalty, for God's loyalty, or my Bible I think has mercy there, your Bible might have the steadfast love, I believe the King James has, or the covenant loyalty. The point is that the first angle of love, the first edge of love in marriage and in families has to grow out of what we know about God. God has a covenant loyalty kind of love. God says to his people, I'm going to love you. I have chosen you. You are mine. You are my spouse. Uh, you are my child. You are the one whom I am showing my favor to. That's the hard edge of love. It's God saying, I will never leave you or forsake you, to put it in the language of Hebrews 13. God says, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. In the New Testament, you've heard of the Greek word agape. Well, agape would be the same kind of idea. The kind of love that says that God is going to hang in there with us. That God loves the world. That God is love. It's the kind of love Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 13 that says this kind of love doesn't fade. It's got a hard edge. And when we speak about marriage love, we've got to convince people in our churches that the first kind of love, there's not, bring me that, that spare one, I can probably use that. Thanks a lot. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you. The hard edge of love says that this is what I'm going to do because it's right, because I have made covenant loyalty. Now, turn your New Testaments to Mark the 11th chapter, or Mark the 10th chapter. This is one of the places that you find out that this covenant loyalty that God has for his people is to be found in marriage. In verse 2, the Pharisees come and test Jesus by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? 
Now keep in mind when you study the Gospels, you study them a sliver at a time. You study one Gospel at a time. Instead of mashing Matthew and Mark together, study Matthew as Matthew and study Mark as Mark. And the point here is that when you're reading Matthew, you get extra words like, can he divorce for any cause? And you have an exception that's there, except for adultery. But when you're studying Mark, which was what was given by Mark to those churches, you don't have those. So you read the hard edge of love in Mark. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And they said, well, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Now, look back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 24. We'll go back there more in just a moment. But that's what they're alluding to. They knew Deuteronomy 24 well. Because God had said that you were to stay married, but in Deuteronomy 24, you've got this exception. And so they say, well, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. But Jesus says, you've got the wrong question going. Their question was, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And notice how often people in our churches are asking the wrong questions. Questions like, what can we get by with? Uh, how far can we go? What is the absolute limit for God? I remember one deacon of one of my churches asking me questions like, but I'm wondering, won't I be happier? Won't she be happier? Won't the kids be better off? Am I going to make it if I leave? Will we be better able to find fulfillment? Those are the wrong kind of questions. A couple in their middle 20s uh, came to me in Circe one time. She wanted out of the marriage. And I said, why? You haven't been married very long. And I said, so? And she said, well, God wouldn't want me to be married if I'm not happy. I said, how do you know God wouldn't want you to be married if you're not happy? She said, well, the Bible says that. I said, where does the Bible say that? She said, well, I don't have a Bible with me. I said, I can solve that. Walked out of the room, got a Bible out of my office and gave it to her. And she said, well, I can't find it right away. And I said, I got lots of time. Find me. Pretty soon after thumbing through, realizing she didn't know anything about Scripture, she said, well, maybe he didn't say that. That's the point. He didn't say that. Haven't some of you here who are married had moments when you weren't exactly fulfilled and ecstatic and happy? You don't have to nod and laugh and smile. You know that's the case. There are lots of times like that. That's why the hard edge of marriage is covenant loyalty. On May the 11th, 1978, I looked at a short blonde in Searcy, Arkansas, and I said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now, you'd thought there'd be somebody up there smart enough to warn me about such a pledge, but there wasn't. There wasn't anybody over 20, 22 on the whole stage. Uh, nobody was married except the preacher who had six whole months under his belt. There wasn't anybody to warn us about such a pledge. Fortunately, because that's the kind of love that you've got to make in marriage. You've got to say that I am never going to leave you or forsake you. We had no way of knowing at the time the kind of things that would come, the dissonance that would come while going through seminary when my learning got way ahead of my spiritual maturity. We didn't know the conflict that would come. We didn't know what it would be like raising a retarded daughter on May the 11th, 1978. At the time, we had no idea of knowing the kind of stress that would bring into our lives that would never go away. But we made a pledge, and so at times the pledge has kept the love together. As you know all too well about marriage, those of you who are married. And they've got the wrong question. And sometimes we have people in our churches asking wrong questions. Unmarried people asking, will I be stuck with this person if it doesn't work out? Can I remarry if I find out this was a mistake? Will I have my degree completed in case it doesn't work out? I've heard all of those, honestly. Or married people saying, can I find a church that will accept me if we divorce? Now, I'm not wanting to, to bash those who are divorced because the gospel is for all and it has a from now on dimension that Jesus speaks about. He says to Peter, I know, Peter, I know you don't even think you can stand near me, but from now on, we believe in the from now on dimension and we heal those who are broken. 
We're not stepping on them and trying to destroy them. But for those who are getting married, for those who are married, we start by proclaiming covenant loyalty. So Jesus sw twists their wrong question with a right answer. He says, let me go back to the beginning. Deuteronomy 24 was not the beginning. Deuteronomy 24 is what God did given the fallenness of the world. Deuteronomy 24 says, if this happens and this happens and this happens and this happens, then this happens. Now, it doesn't come out that way in every translation, but it should. The point is, this is happening, and this is happening, and this is happening. Men are putting their wives away in divorce, and they're getting married again, and sometimes the men ask for them back, and Moses says, you cannot do that. You cannot treat women like chattel. You can't pretend they're slaves. So some people find in this almost an emancipation proclamation for women, saying they have rights. You can't give them and take them and give them and take them. They are protected. But Jesus says even that was not the original design of God. Now that does tell us something. It tells us that very often God's ideal and what God permits in a fallen world are not exactly the same. I think we don't come to grips with that sometimes. God always holds up an ideal, but we need to understand in our churches that sometimes God permits that which is not his ideal. And what he wants us to do is keep proclaiming the ideal, keep, keep modeling the ideal, keep letting people see that the kingdom of God is breaking in but still understanding that this is a fallen world. So Jesus goes back to the text that I had last night and then the text that I think somebody has tonight, Genesis 1 and 2. He says, but at the beginning, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has, my Bible says, joined together, let man not separate. Jesus said the original intent that God has was this permanence. And the only way we can ever be happy in our marriages is if we have this confidence of permanence. Otherwise, it's always like a first date. Do you remember the awkwardness of your first date? Well, marriage isn't like that. Marriage has some confidence. If I fall on my face in marriage, it's all right. It gives me the confidence to reveal myself. It gives me the confidence to open up and to cry and to admit that, that uh, things haven't happened exactly as I had thought. It gives the confidence that the people around us need. But look back at verse 9. A literal translation might be, Therefore what God has yoked, let man not separate. And I wish they had kept the metaphor there instead of just putting it out, therefore what God has joined together. The metaphor is yoked. God has yoked us together. Now that wouldn't be a very popular metaphor today. Can you imagine love songs and contemporary uh, radio about the yoke of marriage? Now we have songs that say things like, I'd subtract 20 years from my life, I'd fall down on my knees, kiss the ground that you walk, romantic fluff. But another beautiful picture of marriage is you wear a yoke. For 14 years, I have been yoked to my wife. It's the hard edge of marriage. And the last thing our society wants is a yoke. A professor of philosophy at the State University of New York at, at uh, Binghamton has written these words. We have been misled with overly inflated expectations about marriage. You can't say you'll love someone forever because it's just not a promise you can realistically make. What you should be saying is, I love you now and I hope I'll love you a year from now. I'll work at it. A better marriage vow may be one designed to protect the offspring of that marriage, one that spells out financial obligations in case of divorce. Now that seems to be a real popular, although not as blatant approach to marriage that says, right now this fits and works, but you may not work in the next segment of my life. In fact, a lot of the future uh, people writing about the future uh, will say that that's how marriage will be seen in the next decade. People like George Barna says that marriage is going to be more like for this segment of my life. In another segment of my life, that person may not fit those goals, and so it may take another person. Carolyn Bird uh, lectured to students at West Hampton College in Virginia, and here's what the report said. Miss Bird suggested that the increasing longevity and in choices about lifestyles will mean that people will marry two or three different people in their lifetime, each for different reasons. Divorces will be quite friendly. 
The success of relationships that Miss Bird envisions will help each partner fill certain developmental needs. Your first love is usually a, be a very inappropriate partner for your ne next task. And on and on it goes. But we believe in a yoke. Uh, we believe in telling our kids, when you get married, there is a hard edge that's not even always fun. It's the kind that says, I'm going to stay with you. It's the kind that God wills. It's my job. Can you imagine me telling my wife that? Honey, I want you to know I'm going to stay with you forever. And you know why? Because it's my job. And I don't think they get me any real bonus points. But it's true, isn't it? It is my job to work at that. And for children, I have a great letter from a girl in Searcy that she, she sent me a copy of. It was a letter to her mom and dad, July 3, 1989. Dear mom and dad, I just wanted to write and say thank you for staying together and being happy. So many kids I know have parents who are divorced or are going to be that way. Thank you for leaving no doubts in my mind that I never have to worry about that. I, I'm sorry I'm not always the person I ought to be, but I'm trying. Keep up your love and support for 19 more years. I love you both. Isn't that incredible? Now, if you come from a broken home and you worry about your kids, we pray for the power of God. I don't mean to be heaping on guilt. But when we start on the front end, that's what we're wanting. A, a new group of people that say that there is a hard edge of love, that I'm going to stay with you that I'm going to follow God's chesed love, His agape love. I'm going to have covenant loyalty. It's not even so much feelings. It's like uh, Charlie Shedd had a fight with his wife one morning, you know, the Christian counselor. He fought with her one morning, and he came home, and there was a big note on the refrigerator. It said, Dear Charlie, I hate you. Love, Martha. <laughs> That's the hard edge of love. The first half of Mark is leading to Caesarea Philippi in chapter 8. And the question is, who is this man? People are looking for the Christ, and the answer at Caesarea Philippi is, he is the Christ. They got who they were wanting, they wanted the Christ. But the question in the second half of Mark is, what kind of Christ is he? And the answer is, he is a cross-bearing Christ. And if you follow him, you have to have a cross as well marriage is. That's why this is found in Mark chapter 10 in the group of sayings of what does it mean to carry a cross? Part of what it means is you stay in there with your spouse. You hold on to that yoke of marriage. There's a commitment that is a timeless commitment with no escape clauses. My favorite book, I guess, on marriage is by Walter Wong. I think it's based theologically, unlike so many books on marriage. And in it, Walter Wonggren says, And the thing that neither one of us, he and his wife, would even contemplate was divorce. We were stuck with each other. He was talking about a difficult time in their life. And he says, Let the world call that imprisonment, but I say it gave us the time and God the opportunity to make a better thing between us. If we could have escaped, we would have. But because we couldn't, we were forced to choose the harder, better road. I think there's an important message here for those in our congregations, our students, our teenagers, our college students, uh, those who are young professionals or just, just young singles. That we're telling them that we do not believe in the church and that kind of wash and wear wedding gowns the world has. We believe in permanence. And that in marrying somebody, one of the things you need to do is get them into a corner and look them eyeball to eyeball and say to them, will you ever under any circumstance leave me? And establish that on the front end. See, preaching for the college church in Searcy, I found a lot of parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents do a disservice to college students because they keep going home for Thanksgiving and they go home for Christmas and spring break and there's always some well-intentioned relative saying, haven't you found anybody yet? And then you have somebody start to say, maybe your standards are too high. Boy, part of me wants to slit the throat of those kind of people. I know what combination of Einstein and Kevin Costner and and whatever else you'd want to throw into the pot, bring their standards. Because you don't have to be married to follow Jesus or to be full. God hasn't demanded that anybody... In fact, He said some people are single for the kingdom's sake. 
And so you wait until you find somebody who will share the vision of the inbreaking of God's kingdom with you. If you find somebody like that and you fall in love and everything else clicks, then that's fine. But I appreciate the fact that you're not just willing to find somebody because you're supposed to find somebody. That's the kind of advice I want our church to give. Well, that's the first part. And I just filibustered over half of our time. But it seems to me a very important one to begin with. And the last one is as well, so I'll try to get to number five. But the second edge of love is friendship. If covenant loyalty is the hard edge of love, then friendship is the soft edge of love. Because you don't want to just tell people getting married, this is a hard edge and you've got to get in there and you've got to grit your teeth and be married. That's not the whole picture. Part of it is marriage is a delight. It's a gift of God. It's a joy. It's a privilege. It's an honor. It's thrilling. The theology for this is that God, Genesis, he makes man and woman, and then God is walking around in the garden with them. God wants fellowship. God wants friendship. He does say, I will never leave you or forsake you, the hard edge of loyalty. But there's also this soft edge of God wanting to be intimate with people. And so out of that grows this soft edge of love that says, well, Diane is not only the person I'm yoked to, but she is my companion. That's the language of Genesis 2. Help meet, I think, means my companion. So a sharer of life. Not a servant, not a boss, not a lover. A companion. That marriage has a companionship. You remember in Fiddler on the Roof, I didn't bring the whole dialogue with me, but there's this time that Tev... And she says, do I love you? Well, I've washed your clothes and made you meals and I, you know, on and on she goes. And he says, no, 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 I know you've done that. I'm asking, do you love me? And this humorous dialogue goes back and forth because he's asking, do you love me? With number two in mind. And she keeps answering, well, I guess I love you. And she answers with number one. He's asking about the soft edge and she answers with the hard edge. Do you love me? Well, I've stuck with you. I've borne your children. I've raised them and I've fed you. And, but do you love me? And finally, almost with her teeth gritted, she says, well, I guess I love you. And he smiles and says, well, I guess I love you too. The problem after marriage we hear so much about uh, marriages that split, but as a Christian minister, I'm as concerned about those marriages together that aren't experiencing the joy of fellowship that God intended. And some of them have the wisdom to seek counseling or to admit to some people in their churches, we need help to fall in love again, but many others won't because they've taken it as almost the mandate that you're not supposed to like each other in marriage. You do your thing, I'll do my thing, and we'll keep this home going. But somebody has recognized that if a couple will continue to engage in those activities that brought them together in the first place, their marriage is likely going to be fun. The problem is, while you're dating, there's a lot of focus on this, on doing things fun, taking long walks, having nice, brief, but joyful kisses, going to a movie, holding a door open, for somebody, talking about favorite books, going to church, squeezing one another's hands. Those are the kind of things that bring you together. Whoever convinced us that a marriage ceremony ought to end all of that? The point is, if you would go back, if we could tell the people in our churches, go back and remember why you fell in love in the first place and start doing that again, maybe there'd be more joy. Go back and take some of those long walks. Have some of those short, joyful kisses. Talk about books. Go to movies. There is a book that I think is uh, available here now by uh, Willard Harley called... that I think some of you have already seen. Uh, in it, Willard Harley talks about uh, the, the special needs that people have in marriage. And he says, what you have to do is make deposits in your marriage. It's just like a bank account. You're either incredible deposits being made. 
Uh, he calls and asks her out. She likes being asked out. And she says, yes, I'd love to go out. She, she gets deposits in his account. And then they, so they give each other deposits. They go out to eat and have a good conversation. They give each other deposits. Time rolls around. He sends her flowers for birthday. Gets a few deposits for that. Unfortunately, it was the birthday of his previous girlfriend, so there are big withdrawals, too. But back and forth they go during this whole time. They're down and focus on careers and trouble because one of the children never grew up. And it takes that constant pressure and time that you forget about all those things that made you fall in love for a while. So what Harley says is you've got to get back and start making deposits again. And I don't know whether I fully agree with him or not, but it seems to bear a lot of credibility that he says that women have five main needs. And if you're going to be friends in marriage, you better meet those needs. Your wife's number one need is affection. She wants you to be affectionate. Now, men tend to translate that in terms of they want to be sexual. But that's not necessarily what it is. They want to be affectionate. They want somebody to be in love with them. And he says another need is conversation. They want to talk. Now, haven't you seen in your own marriages that sometimes we're at different levels in how much we want to talk? I appreciate silence at the end of the day. But Diane wants to discuss the day. Third, he talks about honesty and openness and financial support and family commitment. Those are the top five needs that he's highlighted that women have. My guess is this book isn't politically correct, by the way, uh, but it seems to bear a lot of resemblance to what I've seen in counseling. And he said what women need to offer to their husbands is these top five needs, sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship. That was so important to me. At, at a critical time in Circe, I was into scuba diving and loving it, but I always did it with guys. Diane didn't, she was afraid of water, or not afraid of water, but um, a, a claustrophobic. And so the thought of being down below, breathing out of some little regulator and tank. Because she wanted to be my recreational companion, she went out and she qualified to dive in a lake. It was March in an Arkansas lake. Crawled in bed, her body was shaking just like that. It was actually kind of nice like those old vibrators, you know, that you'd have in a bed. She's just vibrating all that because we've been able to dive together since then. He wants his wife to keep herself up. He wants domestic support. He wants admiration. Well, you can take Harley's book and look at it, take it with a grain of salt, see how much you think is right and how much is not. But the point is that we've got to keep making deposits. We need to be friends in our marriages. Skip all that. Let's go to number three. The third edge of marriage love. This is the hard edge. This is the soft edge. This is the tender edge. The tender edge of love is intimacy. That grows theologically out of the word no. In the book of Hosea, several times, God says, I want to know you. And my people perish for lack of knowledge. Not that they don't have enough up here, they don't have enough down here. When God says, I want to know my people, he, he means I want to walk with them, I want to be intertwined with them, I want, to be fr I want to be intimate with them. And that same Hebrew word for intimacy and God knowing us and wanting to be known by us is the one that's used for the sexual relationship, as I think you know. Genesis 2 and verse 25, God calls that first man and woman to this intimacy. And Genesis 4 and verse 1 says that Adam knew Eve. Obviously not cramming for a newlywed game. He knows her sexually. And uh, just as a footnote here, look later at the... We don't have a lot of time to look to the Song of Solomon, but that needs to be taught to our teenagers. That needs to be taught to our people who are in marriages because so many of us still have grown up with this drag on sexuality that we're embarrassed by it or the church doesn't really believe in it. We're against it. I remember my own church growing up, we didn't talk about sex, but about once a year we had somebody come speak to us. They'd sit all the teens down, he'd speak to us, and he was a doctor. I think the idea was that we would picture him as somebody with a clinical but non-practitioning view of the subject. But we're going to see.
Song of Solomon has these incredible passages. It, if, if you think your teenagers won't read the Bible, introduce them to the Song of Solomon. Uh, these incredible passages about uh, looking at his lover and being amazed at what he sees. With me, uh, the chapter four. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats, this shorn coming up from washing. You know what a turn on that must have been. Each has its twin, not one of them is alone. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David built with elegance. On it hang a thousand shields. Your twin breasts are like two uh, fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I'll go to the mountain of mirth and to the hill of incense. All beautiful you are, my darling. There's no flaw in you. They look at each other from head to toe and they describe the beauty. Part of what we need to tell people in our churches is this is a blessing of God. We don't believe in that old dualism that says spirit is good and flesh is bad. We don't believe sex was made just to... We believe that it was to be rich and personal. We believe that we're not missing out on anything just because we don't live the life of people on Phil Donahue. As one of my uh, seminary professors, Philip Slate, said, his guess is that the best sexual fulfillment in the United States is some old lumberjack who lives out in the woods and doesn't even know about pornography. He just knows he goes home and loves his wife. He said, that's probably the most ecstasy anyone ever has. Because if you get more and more and more, you always think you're missing out on something. But joy is the safety of this relationship in marriage. The Song of Solomon says it's no orgy, chapter 6, verses 3 and, and verses 8. They're refusing to rush. Chapter 3 talks about that. They're confining it to marriage. They're not going to drink from other people's wells, to use the language of Proverbs. But they're committed to one another and to this mutual concern and sexuality. Well, let's go on if we're going to finish here in eight minutes. Uh, the fourth edge of marriage is the, let's call it the countercultural edge, which is submission. So we've got the hard edge, the soft edge, the tender edge, and the countercultural edge. Now, this is a tricky one to talk about in marriage. And I think I heard last night there's a whole class coming up on submission that should be interesting. Uh, the book of Philippians is where I would anchor this theologically. Because in Philippians you find out again what a God of submission we have. In fact, in Philippians 2 verses 1 to 4 you find out that the church there needs to start doing some submitting to one another. They need to stop arguing with one another. We call it sometimes the epistle of joy, but probably joy is what they need, not what they have. They need to be like-minded. They need to have the same love. They need to be one in spirit and purpose. But how are you going to get them to do that? And Paul says, what you need is to return to you. the who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. In other words, God has... Uh, God became a kind of... And the cross was the whole way he lived. It was the, the nature of God to die on a cross because he was a serving God. The application to this for marriage would be that's the kind of love you have to have in marriage that quits worrying about who's in charge. To me, that's more the language of Genesis 1 and the language of what Jesus is trying to restore in this world. Then you ask the question, how can I minister to the one I'm married to? And that's why even Ephesians 5 that speaks about the leadership of the husband begins by saying, be submissive to one another. You follow a serving sir. Now, you can see how countercultural that is. Paul says in Philippians 2 and verse 3, <coughs> well, if you've read the book, The Habits of the Heart, you know they'd be the exact opposite of what you find in our world. Giving the cultural perspective in that book, they say the danger is that one will in sharing too completely with another. And that's the very point of submission. I am losing myself willingly because God has lost himself to me. It's the whole nature of Christianity. And Paul says you must in humility consider others better. And you get to this point where you think this person thinks she's right and he thinks he's right and they have this argument. 
Submission says, well, you know, I may still think I'm right, but I love you and I'm on your side. I'm not trying to win. It's, it's not a case of one-upsmanship. It's one-downsmanship. We're trying to minister to one another. And Paul says, not only to your own interests, but to the interests of the people around you. I think if we preach this in the context of marriage, people would begin to understand that marriage is a kind of suicide. Because you are giving up something of yourself, there's something of yourself that is dying all over again. Now we're really stringing together to see how attractive we can make this. But it's a suicide in the sense that I looked at Diane on May the 11th, 1978, and I said to her, I will minister to your needs. There was a killing of myself that took place there. My interest will not come above yours. We're not going to spend our whole lives serving me. God has given me you as somebody I can love. The act of marriage itself has a death in it. We are forsaking all others, all those other people that you see on campus and in health clubs and in the office. You can't have any of them. You have limited yourself by marriage. What if he's bedridden? Or she has to become the breadwinner and nurse and hear his anger? What if she suddenly looks nothing like she did when she was 20 years old? Submission says that's okay because I pledge to minister to your needs. Let's go on. Uh, just skip all of that. Uh, number five, the last one is forgiveness. If this is the hard edge and this is the soft edge and this is the tender edge and this is the countercultural edge, this would be the divine edge. Because this in marriage, I think, is where we find out whether we can stay together. Theologically, you can see exactly where it's rooted. Look in Ephesians. There, Paul says, you need to forgive each other. This is Ephesians 4 and verse 32. Forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. All five of these are rooted in the nature of God. If you're bringing the perspective of God to marriage, you've got to forgive one another because God has forgiven you. How would you dare not forgive somebody when God has forgiven you? A couple stories that maybe can, can contrast what you find in marriages. Rubel Shelley, in his book on marriage, tells about a man who was unable to forgive his wife that Rubel was counseling. He said, uh, this man found out about something she'd done before they were married. It made him so angry, he kept asking her to recite details. And finally, he made her write out a confession of what she'd done and sign it. He read that confession in his wallet. And every time they had an argument, he'd pull it out and make her read it. Can you imagine the ungodliness involved in that? The flip side of that happened some time ago when an influential evangelical writer and preacher had to resign his his position as president of InterVarsity. And the press release said it was for personal reasons, having been involved in an adultery. Because the media interviewed his wife sometime later. It was the perfect chance to throw a knife in his back and to say, get him out of here, that bum. But what she said is, I pray that people will remember that he was a person of integrity for the 25 years we've been married. I will not dwell on that short period of time when he fell into sin. I like the power of that statement because ultimately that's the only way you can save a marriage. Hopefully for most marriages it won't be adultery, but it'll be something. It'll at least be stupidity. It's got to take forgiveness. And the reason we forgive, Paul says in Ephesians 4, is because God has forgiven you. Not because you're such a great guy or a great girl, but because God has forgiven you. God was willing to cut us clean. And so now we forgive the people around us. We do it realistically saying that I know you have offended me. And we do it prayerfully with no vengeance and no anger. We do it openly, sometimes specifying to our spouse what it was that offended us. And, and then we do it lovingly, telling them both the sin and our forgiveness with no strings attached. Well, our time is up. Let, let's look down through how this maybe fits together as a whole. There's got to be a hard edge of marriage. 
You've got to tell the people in your church that. They've got to understand that we serve a God of covenant loyalty in that covenant. But you don't want to just grit your teeth and have a yoke. And so, because God desires to walk in the garden with us, because God desires friendship, in marriage we also want to be friends. And so we keep making deposits one another. And because God wants... Uh, to know us. We want to know one. And because God has been a submissive God to us, even dying on a cross, we are submissive to one another, watching out for one another's needs. And because God has forgiven us in marriage, we are willing to forgive one another. And may God bless us as we, as we seek to, to meet this challenge of teaching the people around us, our children, our grandchildren, and even one another, and even our own lives, what it means to be married in the name of Jesus. Thank you.